Hi, everyone. So we're back again with a new episode of Media Coffee, a series hosted by Sijin that brings you insight from leading journalists and media organizations across the globe. My name is Nariman, and I'm delighted to be moderating today's session. This episode is dedicated to exploring what companies and PR professionals should know and keep in mind while writing press releases to communicate with LGBTQ community, uh, LGBTQ plus community, and how can they, you know, do it in an authentic way. Um, so I'm excited to have today Sophie Perry, founder of LGBTQ plus uh, journalism network, and Peter Williams, founder of Gaither Platform. Um, so if I can start with Sophie, if you can just tell me a little bit about your network and how it started, tell me about um, you know about just just a little bit about yourself. Yeah, so um, so my name is Sophie Perry. I work in my day job at Pink News, the world leading LGBTQ plus uh, journalism platform. Uh, we cover uh, international news, entertainment, features. And then on the side, I run the LGBTQ plus journalism network. I founded it in January 2022 um, because I was really keen to join a network where I could connect with people, um, uh, you know, network, join, make friendships, um, share stories, things like that. And I found there wasn't anything for LGBTQ plus journalists sp specifically in the UK. Um, there was something in America for, for queer journalists, particularly ones who work in Washington, but there wasn't anything similar. And I just found that absolutely bonkers in 2022. So I was really annoyed about it. And my annoyance turned to determination and sort of 30 minutes on Canva, made a Facebook group, and then we had a whole network and it's it's grown since then. We're nearly at 300 members now on our Facebook group. Um, I've spoken at a number of, number of panels and events about LGBT inclusion, diversity um, in journalism. Um, our members often use the platform to share stories they're proud of you know put pitch calls call out seek sources um effectively what i wanted it to be used for people are organically using it for now and it, it's great to see it growing more people joining all the time and our members they range all the way from students to freelancers to really really senior editors so it's nice that it's kind of got that cross-generational appeal that especially with networking hopefully people can support each other as you know at different stages of their career and development uh, so I think that's a pretty quick fire summary. Um, yeah, that's that's everything for me. Yeah, thanks, Sophie. And it's amazing that you've reached 300 now. Um, it's uh, it's a great number. So thank you so much, Sophie. Uh, Peter, moving to you, if you can tell us a little bit about Gaither. Sure. Hi, my name is Peter Williams. I'm the founder of Gaither, an online LGBTQIA platform. Um, my background's in marketing and change, specifically within the European financial services sector. Um, I'm also a technical writer and a publish author of a number of business books. Um, in terms of Gaither, the reason why it was created was because you look around the community as a whole and the kind of resources that are available. There are some amazing resources and they are designed specifically for the LGBTQ plus community. However, many are very sort of focused on one specific group or to a specific geographical area. I think the issue that I had when I was looking at that was, you know, what happens if you happen to be in the Middle East? What happens if you happen to be in parts of Africa where, let's be honest, some of the rights there are, are quite appalling at the moment? And I wanted to create a, a positive platform where people would get additional information, where they could share stories. And I think over the, the, the time when I started, which was in 2019, the more I sort of delve into it, the more the platform's grown. And I think as a result of that, now it's quite an extensive platform over three sites with a lot of information and it keeps on growing because it's a very interesting subject, but also there's a lot of facts and, fit and information out there that, that exists that needs to be verified, that needs to be kind of shown to the world. And actually in a way that, you know, people can positively learn about the community and also be proud of who they are and where they come from as well. Yeah, thank you, Peter. It's actually there's there's quite a you know conversation about diversity, inclusion, and equity, and all of that. Um, and a lot of companies do um they they do plan ahead, and they they have a lot of different events, different applications that they produce. Um, specifically, let's say about the LGBTQ plus um community. Um, however, every once in a while we hear some issues happening here and there. So I think my first question that I wanted to ask, and I will direct it to Sophie and um, Peter. Feel free to add anything else. If, obviously if you want uh, what should be our PR professional know if they want to write their first press release about or on LGBTQ plus issues um, anything that they should think about before starting writing or while they're writing that press release 
Mm -hmm. So I think, it, you know, you should treat it like any other press release, any other project you're going to run. Research first and foremost. That way that if, you know, you're writing something in relation to a political issue or something that has a lot of context and background, you don't miss a really, really key point and sound exceptionally tone deaf and then potentially have a lot of backlash on social media and from other organisations. Uh, secondly to that, I think it's always really important to speak to the community at hand, the community that you're either you know, promoting something for or writing about. Um, and that way that if you are doing it in such a way that is problematic or perhaps doesn't best reflect that particular group, they can say, hang on, maybe maybe look at it this way. Um, I mean, you particularly you don't want to write a press release or, you know, sort of uh, create a project or push push a product that no one's asked for because you just assume that that's what the community wants and something that comes to mind straight away with with that for me is um a product that was made by three men uh, it was a uh, period gloves um so obviously not directly related to the lgbt community but they were absolutely lambasted on social media by women uh, because these these men, they didn't consult any women. Um, three men created this product because they were shocked, inverted commas, that women don't use gloves to remove their tampons and their sanitary products. And obviously women have been doing that for since the echelons of time. Um, and so they created this period glove you know to protect their dainty little hands from the blood. And of course, women just, as I say, absolutely lambasted them on social media and thought it was hilarious that men thought women needed this. And that's an example of not kind of consulting the community at hand. Um, so I think when in terms of creating press releases for LGBTQ plus issues or topics, exactly the same principles apply. Reach out to the community and do your research. And that way, you know, it's really hard to go wrong. I think from my side, I absolutely agree with what Sophie said. In addition to that, I'd also say it's about being clear on your objectives. Also around, you know, who are you speaking to? Because you know, we are a community, but we're made up of many smaller groups. And, and each of those groups have a different priority and focus. And I think it's about being clear around what you're trying to achieve through the press release as well. And I think it's also not necessarily treating the LGBT community as something different. You know, most of the people in the community are, you know, ordinary everyday people that just happen to love someone that's different to uh, you know yourself and also may identify in a different way so I think it's really about kind of understanding your audience understanding the objective of what you're trying to write and what you're trying to convey and actually present it in a way that actually you know kind of embodies and conveys the right message to the right people and and Sophie, by consulting, do you, are we talking about something like doing surveys, um, uh, focus groups, things like that? I mean, it can obviously take a lot of different forms. Um, obviously, if you're a quite a large PR firm, very likely you're going to have staff that are LGBTQ plus, and they can be your first point of call of just asking you know how should we go about this, involve them in the conversation, but at the same time you don't want to make it that every single time you're talking about something that's even slightly to do with LGBT topics, they become the go-to because that puts a lot of pressure on them. Um, so it's obviously it's just a case of ensuring that the conversation is open, that you're ready to take on criticism, you're ready to listen, you're ready to learn. So yeah, focus groups are a great way, surveys, reaching out to charities and other organisations um, to, to kind of get their viewpoint on it, especially if you're going to be doing, you know, quite a long campaign, maybe involve other groups in that. And that kind of adds an extra voice, an ex extra element to what you're trying to do. And, you know, as we say, ensures that what you are doing is authentic, representative and less likely to get quite a lot of, you know, negative backlash. Yeah, thank you for this. And then um, I think my second question and something that I mentioned earlier, uh, mentioned earlier when I was um, introducing the session is authenticity, uh, because every year we see during June, all different companies, different brands, they have the rainbow flag, all of that, right? And they have different messages across social media. Um, how does how should brand think about being authentic with communities? Like what, what are the steps that they need to do um, while writing or preparing their messaging? And maybe, Peter, you can start with that. Sure. I mean, to start with, as a member of the community myself, I think it's, re I think it's really good that businesses and members of the media, et cetera, take an interest in the community and, and highlight many of those sort of causes and they create products and ranges, et cetera, for the community, which is really positive. I think for me, it's around that 
a lot of activity seems to always happen around Pride Month, and it's always around the sort of month of June, and that's great. Um, but on the same token, you know, a lot of community members live outside of June. They live throughout the whole year, and I think it's around kind of keeping that sort of momentum going and actually being a true advocate rather than just you know showing support for that one small period. I think the second thing for me as well is you know take for example um, a small cafe or a small bakery that basically creates a range of uh, pride or rainbow products. Great, they're showing solidarity and support, but in what way is that helping the community? If you liken that to an environmental cause, for example, now, there'd be an expectation that you know that they'd be contributing in some way to causes that matter to the community, and that's kind of where I come to. In you see a lot of big brands and big organisations creating products where they put the rainbow flag on, they say they they show solidarity, but that's where it ends. And I think for me, it's around you know, why can't those products exist throughout the whole year? Why can't there be evidence of them supporting charities and organizations that exist out there that actually are helping and benefiting the community as a whole, even if it's a small percentage of sales, that to me is, is around being authentic, is around not just saying something, but actually backing up those statements with hard evidence. Thanks, Peter. Absolutely. You have something to add, yeah? Yes, yeah, so I completely agree with what Peter said. Um, you know, anyone can stick a rainbow logo on their social media. They can put some flags outside their building. Anyone can do that. But showing that you're truly engaged with the community, that you actually care about the community, is definitely turning that allyship, that visual public front, into something that, you know, can help people, that is, you know, going to bring about change. So donating to charities, working with organisations, supporting them maybe offering out grants and funding. Um, also to that, your own staff internally. Yeah, you can put a rainbow flag outside your building or on your Twitter feed, but are you actually supporting your own staff, making sure that your policies are progressive, that you know, same-sex couples, for example, who work in your business have the same um, rights and access to things like insurance and um, protections that their heterosexual colleagues have. Um, so it, it's about sort of making sure that you're translating that allyship, that visual element into something that actually matters to people. Because at the end of the day, we love the rainbow flag in this community. We love putting it on things, but we know it's a symbol. It's it's, And we need more than symbolism um, in order to, you know, have change and really make LGBT rights not just something that people celebrate in June, but something people celebrate all year round. And Peter, just going back to something you've mentioned earlier about your platform, that it's also look at uh, different LGBTQ plus community outside of the UK, let's say in, in the Middle East and, or in Africa as well. Do you think brands have a duty to speak up because they're working, obviously, and they're catering to their own customers outside of the Western world, let's say? Um, do you think they also have a duty duty to speak up um, um, when when they see some certain like injustice or certain, uh, let's say, laws that are passed against the community in other parts of the world? Yes and no. <laughs> I say yes and no because many of these businesses are commercial, and, and that's what drives it drives their, their sort of businesses' profitability. I think for me, it's more around celebrating if you have an ethical supply chain, for example, if you know, if you're buying products, I'll give you a, a different example, sorry. I'll give you an example. Um, let's say you have a, a, a product and that product's promoted to the LGBT bus community, but actually in their supply chain, parts of the product and materials used are purchased from countries that have abysmal LGBT rights and protections for their, for their, for their people. It's very difficult for them to them to sell that product and actually state that they're an advocate and a big supporter of the community when actually they're funding regimes and governments that actually are actively persecuting the community as a whole. On the same token, if they don't have that supply chain, if they don't use products from countries that have poor records of human rights, then actually celebrate that and actually communicate that to people and say, you know, a bit like the fair trade type of branding, actually we are an ethical supply chain. We have an ethical supply chain in which our products are sourced from countries that have a good track record of human rights for the LGBT plus community, and not just the LGBT, but wider communities as well. And I think that's for, for me is, that yes, I think it's important these platforms and these organisations actually highlight these factors, but also at the same time, 
understand the profits about profits and understand it's about dr- driving the right sales but also even for the people outside the community what message are you sending when you basically support these regimes when you're not actually using your platform and voice to actually condemn some of the things that are going on around the world and, and we're seeing a rise in anti-lgbtqi sentiments at the moment and i think it's really important that organizations and charities and businesses out there actually do call out and and make that known that they actually don't agree with it and they don't support that type of regime yeah thank you thank you peter for this and then this question for either of you anyone can answer uh, can you give like any example of company that has been successful in being authentic when promoting lgbtq plus um um inclusion pro- products um etc anything anything that you can uh, think of now I, uh, I can um, think of oh sorry Sophie. No, <laughs> sorry. no, PT, you go first. You go first. <laughs> sorry. Um there, there are a number of really good products and campaigns that exist out there. I mean the first thing for me though is um is around the fact that television and films are actually getting better in this space. And the reason I say they're getting better is because I think the point about LGBTQIA plus and the community as a whole is around you know, that we are ordinary people living ordinary lives with the same sort of aspirations as everyone else. And I think what you're seeing now is a slight shift in a lot of um, films and TV shows is actually they're, they're sort of normalising it. You're seeing LGBT couples in the background. They're not the, the main plot. They're not the main story. Of this, but you see them present. And that's kind of you know, our modern society as it exists today. In terms of products, again, it comes back to the month of June and you see a lot of support and, and rallying around. There are a few campaigns. I mean, the one, I, the one I'd like to highlight is UGG, the um, footwear company. They basically brand, rebranded all of their stores uh, to actually show and highlight LGBTQIA plus youths. And the, the branding and the storefront were celebrating diversity and inclusion but at the same time they also had donated to the trevor project which basically has is a platform a charity in america and has a platform that actually supports youths and you know when you consider that you know that, that same year that they did that campaign there was a study of thirty three thousand youths aged 13 to, to 24 i believe um and at that time a high proportion of them were considering or a- actively considering sorry uh, suicide, you you kind of worry that you know there, there's a big pop- population of people out there that are listening to the news and watching what's going around them, and actually it's affecting their mental health. And I think charities and organisations that support that is really really positive. So businesses that actually use their platform in that way, I think, is a really positive thing personally. Yeah, and then um, I'm going to flag um, her the dating app. Um, it's a lesbian dating app. Um, but it's obviously open to um, non-binary and trans women as well. And they've had a lot of backlash in recent months for being an inclusive dating space. Um, but the founder has continually said that's what it was from day one and that's what it will remain. And they've been very steadfast on social media, remaining inclusive, remaining with the community, defending trans people against um, quite horrific backlash. Um, that I think that's a really good way of doing it because... So often companies will, as we mentioned, put the rainbow flag out there, put, um, you know, pretty things on their social media, but they won't actually really take a stand and really stand against bigotry. And so when companies do that, they are putting themselves in the firing line quite significantly, but they know that they're doing right by the community. And, and that's very admirable. What do you think, Sophie, are the challenges when when companies try to communicate with the community? Mm. Yeah, so I think um, in terms of the phrase challenges, um, that immediately sets up the idea that people are going to get it wrong from the start. I think instead we should think of it as what considerations can you make? So, you know, if we think about this in terms of different communities, if we say, oh, what challenges about speaking with the Jewish community or what challenges about speaking with the Muslim community, it kind of suggests that people are going to get things wrong, that it's, you know, the debate and discussion is is immediately going to be a very negative situation. So if we think about the phrase considerations instead, um, Pete, it's, it's just about considering how do LGBTQ plus people talk about themselves and talk about each other? Now, as a minority community that for a very, very long time was marginalised into the shadows completely, 
we developed our own language for things, our own phrases, our own words. I mean, if we think about Polari, the uh, the um the the language that is near enough extinct now that people used to talk to each other in completely coded language, so people wouldn't know what they're talking about while they're sitting in a pub having a beer. Um, that's a great example of that. But we have our own phrases and words now. Um, that that kind of the community use, especially like in terms of drag race and things like that. And so if if people take the time to understand the language we use and the way in which we talk to each other, that can really help. Obviously, of course, there's, there's other elements to that. Um, asking about pronouns, never assuming people's identity. And for a lot of people, um, respect is a really big thing. If you just say, hey, um, you know, what pronouns do you use? Or, hey, do you call your partner your husband or or what what sort of language do you use? Because some people, you know, they might be married, but they might not like using sort of gendered language like husband, wife, so on and so forth. That it's just taking that time to ask. And people would far appreciate that than just assuming. Um, so I think that's that's sort of where we can go with that. Rather than thinking of it as a challenge and something to, you know, overcome so, you know in that way it's about making these considerations and taking the time to get to know the community i think that's the best way of thinking about it peter please feel free if you want to add something i, I totally agree i think the additional things i would add as well it's about how you can incorporate that into your existing communications as well it doesn't always have to be a targeted communication to the community it can be a, a sort of a section within an existing report or existing campaign that actually talks about how you address it. So I'll give you an example of the opening of the store. You can actually include in that, you know, how you are being inclusive, how you, you know, how, again, to, to the pronouns, to how you train your staff and just how you welcome the students into that to that business and, and you want to welcome those individuals. And that's what it really sort of comes down to. It's around how you can engage with the community, but not just in a targeted campaign, but also how you can do it in existing communications as well. And again, to the point, not treating the community as something that you should fear, but actually something we can engage with. And, you know, there are a lot of us around the world. And as, as a result of that, it's a big opportunity and a big market to actually welcome those individuals into, into your businesses and services. Um, you're catering, let's say, a specific product for a specific type of people. Um, so, so yeah, it's, it's just interesting that... Um, I think I noticed while reading or watching different um, uh, different campaigns that the fear of offending people, um, and obviously it just goes back again to you needing to do your homework, as Sophie said, understand the community, understand the different ter terminologies and the different uh, words that they that you need to to use to basically address these communities. I think community are very vocal as well. So again, back to Sophie's point, you can engage with groups, etc. But also just going on social media and you know, on platforms such as Reddit, you know, people do give honest opinions in a lot of these sort of places. And you don't necessarily have to share your brand's name or your or product you're launching, but just engaging with people and getting their views and opinions can actually make the product go from good to great. Yeah, absolutely. Thank you. Um, I think, well, um, Cision does uh, or produce a report called State of the Media Report. Um, and in this year's uh, um, 2023, basically it highlighted the importance of data and expert voices. Um, so bringing data and information from expert, vo expert voices from different communities. So how can we identify these voices within the LGBTQ plus community? Obviously, there is a lot of people speaking, a lot of people having, you know, different, even within the community itself, there is different people with different opinions. Um, so how do you think we should define those extra voice, voices and finding them? From my side, I, again, it comes back to um, the fact there are no like sort of official sources. You know, there aren't countries around the world do not do uh, include LGBTQIA questions as part of their censuses especially in those countries where it's illegal. You, know, you don't want to include those sort of questions as well, to be honest. But also, there are many organisations, very good quality, it's a good new phrase, there are a number of very, very good organisations, charities out there that provide excellent services and advice, but some of them are targeted, and they are targeted, again, to specific regions, to specific smaller groups in the community. And again, many of those groups have different priorities and different agendas, so I think the, the the answer to your questions is very difficult. I think to be honest, to to get a wide range of of reliable sources out there. But on the same token, it doesn't necessarily mean that um, 
they shouldn't attempt to, to get some of that information together. So again, you know, there's a lot of universities that do amazing studies in which they get good sample size um, analysis where they interview and survey people from their local community. It's a very isolated view and a very sort of focus in a particular area region, but it still gives some insight. And again, you know, you look at statistics, they, they range in terms of the size of communities, anything from 5% to 15% by, by some organisations and groups. So it's very difficult, but on the same token as well, we can see in our own society how things are changing. And again, it's very difficult for me to, to you know, listen to countries like Uganda with their laws that are coming out, those anti-gay laws that are coming out right now, to listen to them and basically to believe that actually they, they believe, sorry, that no one in that country identifies in that way. And then the reality is they do exist. A lot of them are very good at hiding who they are and operating within society, but they do exist. And I think as a result of that, you know, it's important that we highlight that and we actually give that those people a voice and actually bring some statistics together, even though they may be informed statistics, they still are important. Yeah, so I'm I'm just going to add to that and say that I yeah, completely agree with um, what Peter was saying about a lot of charities have people ready to offer their sort of expert opinions. Um, I know as a journalist, I've reached out to quite a number of charities over the years and they've been able to provide really enlightful, um, you know, enlightening sources um, for stories and for content. Um, I'm also just going to kind of touch on the fact with expert voices that we're, we live in an age of fake news, at, you know, at the moment. Um, AI is becoming a massive thing. Um, the blue tick that for so long meant authenticity and, you know, being official no longer has that sort of trust in it because anybody can pretty much buy a blue tick now. And especially for the, you know, Joe public out there who might not be very clued up with what's happening on social media. For example, my parents didn't know anything that was going on with Elon Musk buying Twitter when I and I had to explain the whole situation to them that someone might read a tweet or read a post from um someone who is a very disingenuous source, but because they've got a blue tick, they would trust them and think, oh that's that's true, that's real. And obviously that fits into this wider narrative that we've sort of touched on a little bit in this in this chat, that anti-LGBTQ plus sentiments are growing. Uh, we look at the groomer narrative, which has exploded on Twitter in the last year, the idea that LGBTQ plus people are out to hurt children just inherently. Um, and it's people who are disingenuous, who use these platforms in a very nefarious way, are pushing that. So the PRs out there who are looking for expert sources need to really be making sure that they are examining who they're reaching out to. Is this person reputable? Are they, you know, chronically online or do they actually have pictures and, and videos and things of them at actual events? Are they a, a real person or are they, you know, almost a catfish hiding behind a fake image? And and that's something that people should really uh pay attention to, especially in the upcoming years, as we mentioned, AI is becoming a massive thing that can sort of create voices and content that is it doesn't exist basically uh, so i think there's a lot to consider but it's it's just kind of using those basic skills of fact checking cross checking and to use the old journalism phrase when in doubt leave it out i mean also as well so i totally agree and i think everything i'd add to that as well is around how in, in today's day and age you sometimes hear see headlines but actually, when you read the story, the headline doesn't reflect the story as well. So I think sometimes, mm -hmm. if you take my parents' generation, they will often read the headline and take that as fact, without actually reading the full article. And as a result of that, sometimes a lot of misinformation. And also points, you know, back to Sophie's uh, points, was that there are, there are individuals out there that basically make a range of statistics and facts that have no foundational basis. They just make these, you know, claims that people are doing certain things to certain groups and vulnerable groups in, in society but there's nothing to back up there's no police reports to back it up and that's that's a concern i think to be honest as we go forward yeah thank you sophie a lot and obviously for mentioning fake news because that was actually my next question uh, because i use tiktok a lot and oftentimes i find myself having to go you know to google and basically check or fact check the information that i, I hear basically there so how how common is false reporting on the lgbtq plus community uh, do you see do you obviously i know as you mentioned sophie the sentiment around you know people fearing for their children a lot of that is growing uh, but do you see other false reporting and how can companies, aside from obviously what Sophie just mentioned, how can they actually help proactively fight these uh, false reporting and fake news? 
Yeah, so I'm going to echo quite a lot of what I said previously that we live in an age of fake news. False reporting is common on all fronts, on all topics, you know, everywhere in the world. Uh, you know, in terms of LGBTQ plus topics, as I say, there's the groomer narrative. Um, there's one that I've reported on quite a few, which is absolutely bonkers. This uh, conspiracy theory in America that schools are installing cat litter boxes in toilets for pupils who identify as cats. It's absolutely not true. It's literally not true at all. It's been disproven multiple times. But politicians in America, really high figures, retweet this stuff. They believe it. They think it's happening. And so obviously, what hope do the public have? Um, so in terms of PRs and, and creating campaigns, it, it's that whole thing of fact checking, researching. What are people saying about it? Are the sources that you're using, are they trustworthy? Um, so in and kind of wide to that, as we mentioned, that um, I think it was Peter, sorry, that you mentioned that um, statistics are used and they have absolutely no real scientific basis. You can ask 100 people, what do you think of this? And then suddenly that's applicable to the whole of the UK or the whole of Europe. And it, it's just not factual. So in terms of using data um, to help inform reporting and kind of give it a real good basis, look to official sources. We have the census data this year for the UK, which for the first time includes information on sexual orientation and gender identity. Of course, there is concerns that there is a slight amount of underreporting because if people aren't out, they aren't in a safe situation, they're not going to put those bits of information into a census report. So there is the chance that we've underreported slightly. But otherwise, it gives us a good idea of what the LGBTQ population is, where they're located. You know, you can go in and dive into the data and see which areas have the most trans people, which areas have the most lesbians, and then do that sort of by age, by religion, by a variety of different factors. And that can really help inform any press releases you want to put out, any projects you want to work on, who you aim that at, where you aim that at, what publications you aim that at. So it's really just making sure you're using those skills um, to really just check check out what you're using and not put any further false reporting forward. I mean, I think it's also an element of um, around showing your workings as well. So if you are using statistics um, to sort of highlight a specific area, then you know, make sure you include the official sources, but also as well, you know, show your workings if you actually compile that analysis yourself. I mean, a lot of people out there have a background in data analysis and, and they can make informed decisions I mean, and give informed estimates. But on the same token as well, if you don't show your workings and no one knows how it's calculated, then it can't be reliable or trusted. And there's a lot of that at the moment where you, know, you, you see percentages and you see numbers banding around, but there's nothing that actually supports or, or can narrate how they came to that uh, conclusion. Yeah, thank you. Thank you so much. So going back to Sophie, this is the end of um, our interview. Thank you so much. But do you have anything extra or final that you would like, final recommendation that you would like to mention? Mm -hmm. Yeah, so I think my big thing is I've received a lot of press releases over the years from PRs who have just chopped and changed other releases um, and just added in LGBT into the, the email headline. And it's literally got nothing to do with the community, the, perhaps even the most tenuous link possible. And it's just so disingenuous. And it really puts me off from that PR, that that PR firm and working with them because I just feel there's absolutely no commitment. They're just pushing content. They're just pushing things out without actually considering, OK, if I was to use this, what would the community think of it? What would people read that and think of it as? So I think it's just considering your approach, making sure that what ev everything you're doing from what you're writing to what products you're pushing to the campaigns you're telling, uh, you know, the stories that kind of come into that, the voices you're using, is it genuine? Is it authentic? And if you weren't the person who were working on this and you were the one consuming it, what would you think? Because if you think, oh, that's a little bit, that's a little bit rubbish, then maybe it is. So I think that's a really important thing to consider. Thank you, Sophie. Going back to you, Peter. So, I mean, from my side, it's about again being clear on the objectives. It's about having empathy for the community and who you're speaking to. And I think ultimately, it's around how you can embed 
many of these sort of methods and communication tools at, at your disposal within existing communications as well. So not just, again, going back to the point about not just having targeted communications in June, but actually including the narrative as part of all, all communications that you send out rather than just specific and specialist ones.